G'day. If you've been watching some of my previous videos, you'll notice that they've been looking specifically at overexcitabilities. But today marks a bit of a shift in where I want to go with these videos. And instead of looking at overexcitabilities as a problem and dealing with those problems, I want to look at some of the benefits of having overexcitabilities and some of the places that your wonderfully gifted and quirky mind might be able to take you. Today, we're going to start by looking at Dabrowski's theory of positive disintegration. Now, in previous videos, we've talked about Dabrowski because he was the person who came up with the theory of overexcitabilities. Now, unlike most psychological theories, Dabrowski actually believed that anxiety and stress were beneficial for helping a person shape their core personality. Now, for people with overexcitabilities, this is actually good news because your tendency to experience the world in a stronger and more emotional way can actually accelerate positive disintegration. So today we're going to look at what the theory is and the basic premise of it. And I'm also going to give you a slightly different, more pop culture way in understanding what positive disintegration is. Basically, Dabrowski's theory centers around five levels of personality. Now on level one, he has a level called primary integration. Now this is a level where you feel like you fit in. You live by society's rules and values and you're reasonably uncritical and accepting of what is. So basically you fit in. At the other end is level five or secondary integration. Now, these are people who truly live by their own rules and values, and they are also integrated. But in the middle is where the inner chaos or disintegration happens, levels two, three, and four. Putting the names aside, basically the phases are, at level two, you begin to question society's values and rules. So society's rules start to confuse you. You begin to spot hypocrisies um, and injustices in the world and you start to see a gap between the way the world is and the way it should be. At level three you start to think about better alternatives to society's rules and values. You start being conflicted about what is and what should be and start to see better choices. Now at levels two and three if you can't move through the confusion and the conflicts that you see in the world, there is a possibility that you can be pressured to move back to level one. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how normal psychology does put pressure on people to move that way and to try and fit in. But once you move past that to level four, you consciously take control of these differences in rules and you start to consciously form your own better rules and values that you try to live by. You understand that you can be more. And then once you've dealt with all your conflict and disintegration, you can finally move on to level five, where you can truly be and truly live your own life. I'm going to explain this, these five levels of positive disintegration using something you might be very familiar with. And that is the movie, The Matrix. So if you've ever seen The Matrix, Neo goes through his own form of positive disintegration. And I'm talking about the first Matrix movie, so we'll move him through the stages. So at level one, he is basically Mr. Anderson. So this is where he accepts the way that the world should be. He's working at a software company and helping his landlady take out her garbage, as Agent Smith would say. But as Neo moves on to level two, Morpheus describes it as him having a splinter in his mind, something he starts to recognise is not right with the world, uh, and he wants to try and find alternate answers. And that's when he becomes Hacker Neo. So he starts committing his computer crimes and starts seeking out Morpheus. Now, he goes through an interesting phase where he moves between two and three a little bit. Uh, and this is at the beginning of the movie where he comes across Trinity. So at first he gets the knock knock neo follow the white rabbit message on his computer from Trinity and he starts to move on to the phase I like to call Trinity's bitch. So he's trying to seek further answers to explain a better way of how the world could be. 
Uh, but he does a backflip and goes back to level two for a while when he receives the flip phone via the FedEx guy. Remember, he crawls out onto the side of the building and freaks out a little bit and ends off going up with Agent Smith. Now, he ends up getting a robot put into his belly button and he does eventually move on fully to level three uh, when Switch calls him out on being a copper top. Now, he nearly gets out of the car and doesn't go to meet Morpheus, but Trinity convinces him again that he's been down the previous ro roads before. So he's already had previous explanations of how the world should work. Uh, and he realises that those answers that he'd been given by society didn't work for him and he needs to move on. So he agrees to go and see Morpheus with Trinity. Dabrowski would say that once you move past level three and go on to level four, there is no turning back and you will continue to move forward. And this is when Neo takes the red pill. That is his point of no return. And he comes out into the real world. He is now conscious of the matrix. And this is equal to Dabrowski's level four when an individual starts to make their own choices about the values and the morals that they will follow. This is where Nero gets to learn Kung Fu and he gets distracted by the woman in the red dress. So he's out in the real world. But once he visits the Oracle and he's given the keys to becoming the chosen one, that is when he starts his journey onto level five. So he starts to leave his doubts and his pain behind as he starts to accept that he is indeed the chosen one and that both his and Morpheus's life and fate is in his hands. He starts to gain control and confidence and then cheats death and kicks Hugo Weaving's ass. So that's basically the five levels of positive disintegration as explained by the Matrix. So there's a lot of inner conflict and turmoil going on there. And that's what Dabrowski was talking about is the emotional pain that was necessary to move forward. Of course, you can't start to question what's going on in society, what's going on in your own matrix in your head, unless you go through some sort of conflict at first and pain and feel the difference between the way the world is and the way you believe that it should be. However, there's a slight problem with this, and Dabrowski points it out himself, because he says, almost as a rule, these factors are related to increased mental excitability, depressions, dissatisfaction with oneself, feelings of inferiority and guilt, states of anxiety, inhibitions and ambivalences, all symptoms which the psychiatrist tends to label as psychoneurotic. When you go through inner conflict and inner struggle and turmoil and anxiety about how the world should be and how it is currently, well, they're all things that would generally send you to a shrink. And the minute you go to a therapist or a counsellor or a psychologist, they are likely to tell you to try and integrate yourself back to level one. Fit in, set some goals and go along with society. And that's what most of their therapy is based around. But according to Dabrowski, that's not the way you should be going. You should be pushing through that pain and trying to come to your own conclusions. You should be different. You should be eschewing yourself of the matrix. That makes it very, very hard for you to get along in society when all those anxieties and tensions are the very things that people are trying to get you to avoid. The suffering, the fact that you are now thinking different to the rest of society, that you've taken the red pill and you've moved on, and the fact that these things are contrary to common psychological practice all means there's continued pressure from the external world to revert back to level one. Good luck ever getting to level five and good luck leaving the disintegration and the painful stages behind you. The transformative process of positive disintegration is going to present people with some real world problems the increased anxiety, the need to move away from how the world is to how the world should be in your mind and the need to form your own values and morals is going to put you under some significant pressure and it's certainly going to differentiate you from those around you which can leave you in a pretty lonely place.
I'm not saying I've got all the answers for how to deal with that particular conundrum. In fact, I don't. And I spent a lot of time trying to work through this stuff myself. But I've got four hints that I'm going to share with you that are working somewhat for me. And I hope that by sharing this with you, that you might be able to take some of this and apply it to your own process of positive disintegration, if that's what you're going through. So my first hint is to understand the components and the process of positive disintegration and how overexcitability fits into that picture. Arming yourself with information is pretty much the best thing that you could possibly do. If you don't understand the process and you don't understand the benefits that the anxiety and the depression can deliver to you, believe me, you can end up in some really dark and horrible places. And as I said, if you go to a therapist, they're just going to encourage you to go back to level one and to try and fit yourself in because they're doing that for you because they believe it's the best thing for you not to feel lonely and not to feel anxious and not to feel depressed. And you can understand why that's being done. But if you have that knowledge about overexcitabilities, if that's what you have, and you understand the process of positive disintegration, you can be armed and ready for the process to a certain extent. And you can understand that there's going to be a light at the end of that tunnel and that the process is okay and that you are okay. And you're not in fact neurotic, you are in fact going through a very normal process. Now my second hint is auto psychotherapy. Um, I cannot recommend enough getting yourself a journal and starting to write out your thoughts and feelings. And I'd highly recommend starting with this question, which I did, is who do I want to be? For me, by starting with who I want to be as a person and the values that I want to live by and basically drawing up my ideal self as how I want to live um, and how I want to project myself to the world has been a great starting point for me to try and get my thoughts in order. Um, and it's allowed me then to compare external frameworks, external modes of thought to how I want to live my life. So if I want to be true and honest, how does some of the things that I see going on at work and out in society fit around that? How do my behaviours match up against that? So for me, who do I want to be was the key question for helping me on this journey. My third hint um, is that you need support from supportive humans. You need friends, my friend. Uh, you really do. And even if you intend to live your life very differently and outside the box for the rest of society, and if you decide that the human being that you want to be and is generally true in your heart, uh, is going to be a very lonely and odd person, you're still going to need people around you. Um, now, the questions come up in our Adults with Overexcitability's Facebook group of, you know, how are you ever supposed to find someone like you in order to connect? Um, and I responded to that particular person with the fact that I don't think you necessarily need to form relationships with people who are like you, particularly when you are super different. You just need to find someone who is empathetic to you in being different. So someone who understands and values difference, not necessarily someone who is exactly like you. So if you can find those supportive and empathetic humans, cling on to them for all they're worth. And my fourth hint is thought play. Um, now I'm gonna do some videos in the future of exactly what thought play is. Um, and how I do it in my own mind. But basically, it's pulling apart society's constructs and their frameworks of thought and putting them back together in different ways so they sit better in your mind because you really need a way to deal with those external ideas so they don't bother you. It's not about changing the world and changing society. It's really just about reconstructing ideas um, you know, for example, there's political ideas out there, there's religious ideas, they're all conflicting, um, and some of them might be too basic for you or not sit well with you. Um, and those pressures are going to keep coming if you are different and you've decided to draw your own moral lines in the sand. So you need some way to be able to deal with those ideas, to have them sit better in your mind, simply so they don't bother you and they're not being a pain in the butt and you're not continually wrapped up in existential worry. 
Um, so that's my four uh, key hints is to try and understand the components of the process and understand what positive disintegration and overexcitabilities is. Get yourself a journal and start on your own autopsychotherapy journey. Um, find those supportive humans out there and start to engage in a little bit of thought play and rearrange some of society's stuff in your own mind. Because as Morpheus said, what you must learn is that these rules are no different to the rules of a computer system. Some of them can be bent, others can be broken. And in my next videos, I'm going to do my own little show and tell of some ways that I have bent and broken those rules of society to make them fit better in my own mind. Until then, please remember, I am not an expert. I'm just one person with OE trying to share my ideas in order to spread some happiness. See you later.